So now if you can just give us an idea about what was the basic fundamental foundation of Marxism or communism. Well, Marx and Engels said the entire communist theory or program may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. So there you go. I mean, that's so if, if, if you had Marx and Engels in the room and said, hey, um, in one sentence, describe communism, they'd say, well, that's easy. We did in the Communist Manifesto, right? The entire communist theory may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. Um, beyond that, they had other basic little definitions. Marx said, communism begins where atheism begins. And here, if I may read just a couple of bullet points, this is Marx and the Manifesto. Um, Marx and Engels in the manifesto. Communism represents the most radical rupture in traditional relations. By the way, which it sure does. They acknowledge that communism, quote, seeks to abolish the present state of things, right? Seeks to abolish the present state of things, of all things, right? I mean, it, it, this is key because we're going from abolition of private property to abolishing the present state of things. So people who think, and, and young people say this in surveys, well, communism's a pretty good idea. I mean, they talk about love and sharing and sharing the wealth. No, read the book. They talk about abolishing the present state of things. These guys aren't tinkerers. They're not talking about like increasing tax rates, right? They're not talking about adding a couple of programs to the, to the welfare state. Abolish the present state of things. What does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? <laughs> well, in, in, the, in the case of when you read the, to, the totality of what they're writing, it's, it is truly a totalitarian philosophy. And totalitarian in the strictest sense of the word, a fundamental transformation of human nature. I mean, they are really looking to, to redefine human nature. The final paragraph of the Communist Manifesto, everybody remembers, workers of the world unite. Um, you have nothing to lose but your chains. They write this in the final paragraph. The communists openly declare that their ends can be attained only by, now listen to this, only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Okay? Our ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. I mean, you and I, right, we, we, we know this as, as scholars and intellectuals, you, you never say all about anything, right? You might say um, communists call for, for the forcible overthrow of those things in society which are unjust, right? They want the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. And you know, Marx, um, here's one more phrase in the manifesto, close of the manifesto, last page of the manifesto. Communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. Now you hear that and you think to yourself, this explains a lot, right? You might be watching a particular rally on TV, a riot or whatever, and you think, why is that guy there with a hammer and sickle? What does that have to do with communism? Wait, they're protesting the unjust death of George Floyd? What's the communist doing there? What does that have to do with communism? Well, if whatever is going on, right, is some sort of movement against the existing social and political order of things, these guys will be there, right? Uh, I mean, they'll team up. If, if, if it's redefining um, marriage or gender or whatever else, something that might, you might think doesn't have anything to do with capitalism or anything that these guys could have thought of in the 1840s. If it's about redefining and annihilating the existing and so social political order of things, they'll be there. Uh, Paul, do you think he wrote this book with Engels for them to ex experience the power themselves? Or was it, because I read somewhere where when this book was taken by, you know, Lenin, Stalin, all those guys, it was almost like they, they wanted to take ownership for what this could happen, but Karl couldn't fulfill his own prophecy. What was his long-term aspiration of writing this book? So the book came out in 1848. So he had been 30 years old. He died in 1883. Um, Ingalls died a little bit after that. So, you know, he lives for 35 years after the publication of the book. And he talks in some of his glowing moments about how communism will allow for him to fish in the morning, 
um, uh, you know, farm in the afternoon, raise cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, right? He talks about it in this very utopian language as to whether he would have lived to see it if he believed he lived to see it, I don't know. But, but you know, he talked about communism as this dialectical march of history, this inevitable march. This is part of the point of communism. This is inevitable, they believe. This is the inevitable logic and march of history. In fact, it, uh, Engels called it, they called it scientific socialism. And, and Engels said in his eulogy for Marx at Marx's funeral, he said, this is the Darwin of the social sciences. He has done for the social sciences what Darwin did for evolutionary biology. This is a natural evolution of history. So history would, would evolve from feudalism, slavery, from feudalism and slavery to capitalism, to socialism, to communism, right? So socialism would be the final transitionary step to communism. Lenin and the Bolsheviks, they get into power. Lenin at one point in January 1917 was depressed. He said, I don't think I'll live to see the revolution in my lifetime. And then America declared war, uh, World War I, Woodrow Wilson, April 2nd, got a war declaration from Congress, April 6, 1917. The Tsar abdicated and the Germans put Lenin on a boxcar and let him pass through, dropped him in the middle of St. Peter's Square. And by October of 1917, the Bolsheviks had their revolution. So, um, and Marx and Lenin and Stalin and these guys, they believed, Lenin wrote a number of important articles and statements on this. They believed that the revolution needed a vanguard a regime, a cadre, a group of individuals, a kind of an anointed group to raise the consciousness of the masses and the workers, right? You couldn't just wait for this to transcend, for this to evolve. No, we got to abolish this now. We got to abolish that now. We got to get to work. We got to take power. Got it. So if you're, if you're looking at it right now and you were to say the following countries are full on communism, what would you say is full-on communism based on their definitions? Castro's Cuba, the, the Castro brothers, right? Raul now, Fidel died a couple years ago. The Kims, North Korea, those are really textbook cases of totalitarian communism. And you, know, and you hear, get this all the time. Somebody watching this will probably complain, um, a Marxist out there. They say this all the time, Patrick. Oh, well, that's not really communism, right? That's an aberration of communism. Right, that, yeah, Marx and Engels would have never supported the gulags. Well, you, you go, go to Marx and Engels 10 point, what they call for the forcible overthrow of all existing conditions, forcible overthrow. Go through their 10 point plan. They say right there at the 10 point plan, of course, in the beginning, this cannot be affected except by means of despotic inroads. I mean, they realize any, any you're a business person, any um, business person, non-business person, anybody should realize that if you make a call for the abolition of private property, you're going to have to use guns and gulags. I mean, people aren't going to roll over for that. And right then and there, you ought to, you ought to say to yourself, if, if this is an ideology that's going to require locking people up and killing them and putting them on trains and hurting them off to concentration camps, maybe we shouldn't go there, right? <laughs> maybe this is a bad idea, right? Uh, but but that's uh, th this is an ideology that necessitates prison camps. I think so, it's unavoidable. So when you hear Chinese Communistic Party, what, what mm -hmm. what's communistic about China? Yeah, that's a great question. And modern China is such a weird case, right? So you have you have a country that from 1949 to 76 under Mao and the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, you know, that was full-blown Maoism, communism, as Mao saw it, right? The signification of Marxism, as he saw it. And then Deng Xiaoping came in in 1978-79, created what he called socialism with Chinese characteristics, where they reversed the collectivization. They started doing mass privatizations. They started freeing up the economy. And basically they did what was no longer economically communism. So you have the weird situation in China to this day where you have a country that's politically communist, a one party communist state, but not economically communist. So what I does call that mean? It, yeah. What does that mean? One political party communist, government is communism. What does it mean government is communism? 
Well, and this is where this is where the Soviet Union was, right? And and the big thing that Mikhail Gorbachev did in 1990, they abolished Article 10 or is it Article 6 of the Soviet Constitution, which had a Communist Party monopoly on political power. And you know, every every communist state ever, you can only have one political party. By the way, and you can't have free elections <laughs> because people won't vote for communists, right? <laughs> when I mentioned the, the, the elections in Poland in June 1989 earlier, Patrick, they put 100 seats up for contested elections. Communists lost 100 out of 100, okay? They didn't win a single seat, right? That's why Castro's Cuba won't hold elections. This is why they don't hold elections because people will vote communists out. People in the West are like, communism is a pretty good idea. They don't live under it, right? Then why don't the people ever vote for it? Why don't the leaders allow the people to vote for it? So in China, you have a single party, communist party controlled state that doesn't allow political parties. The leader of the party is the chairman, the president, whatever becomes the leader of the country. And they're smart enough to realize that if they want an economy that works, you can't do true economic communism. You got to allow enough free market reforms that you won't go broke and starve to death. So it's weird what they're doing with communism in China. It's a very different thing. It's, and it's totally unlike North Korea or Cuba. So if you like this little short clip from an interview I did, click over here to watch the entire interview. And please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.